Welcome to the Nonprofit Council Podcast, a podcast that provides everything you need to start and lead a nonprofit organization that will change the world. We understand that starting a nonprofit can be overwhelming, and that's why we're here to shortcut the learning curve for you. Our expert guests will share their knowledge and experience to help you avoid common mistakes and set your organization up for success. So tune in to the Nonprofit Council podcast and let us help you turn your passion into a thriving nonprofit organization. Now your host, May Harris. Today on the Nonprofit Council podcast, I get the opportunity to interview Crystal Troll, who is the founder and principal of, Christ- of CT Nonprofit Consulting, um, an organization that assists nonprofit organizations and founders. Welcome to the Nonprofit Council podcast, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Good to see you, May. It's good to see you too. It's really funny. We were talking before um, we started the recording for this podcast about, you know, it, well, I wanted to share with Crystal, like we've passed each other, I'm sure, at conferences, passed each other at U- at the University of San Diego, but I don't think we've ever really had the opportunity to sit down and have a real discussion. So I'm mm-hmm. really excited about this. I know. And we shared students. I know we've had the same students, too. We have. And, you know, I was looking in preparation for this podcast a little bit about your background, and it is like... Uh, somewhat of a mirror common copy of my own. So, you know, you started as a nonprofit executive director. I think you started at National High, started at Kinder, and then went to development. You went to Ronald McDonald House. I went to the Water Conservation Garden. Um, And then somewhere along the lines, we both made the decision as an executive director to go back to school. (laughs) <laughs> right. And we both chose uh, the University of San Diego. So maybe you can tell me a little bit about that process for you, because I think maybe a lot of our listeners, they're like, oh, I'm a nonprofit executive director. Why would I have to go back to school? What is there for me? So maybe you can share a little bit about your journey. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, although I haven't got my law degree yet. That's probably next. <laughs> well, next. So, yeah. Check, check. <laughs> I may do that. Uh, so my education journey. Well, you know, I think um, I've always loved learning. So as an executive and being in the nonprofit world, you know, I didn't I didn't go to school to, to be a nonprofit professional where there's a lot of programs that are out there these days where you can actually get a degree in nonprofit management, which is what we taught it. Um, and I always knew that there was value in learning common practices, learning from people who have been in the sector for a while. And that's when I found the master's program in nonprofit management leadership at uh, USD, University of San Diego. And uh, I originally started off just taking uh, one course, like as a certificate program. But then after the first course, I thought, oh, I'm hooked. I, I got to do this with my master's. So doing that program put me into another level, I think, of, of understanding how to lead and manage a nonprofit organization because it gave me experience in all the different facets of, of what it means to run a nonprofit. Um, so I used it in working with boards and developing programs, doing evaluations, assessment, um, you know, understanding what that means. And I and then I moved into consulting. And then as a consultant, I found that, um, you know, for moving, uh, for doing assessment work, evaluations, and even just uh, working with boards too, that doctorate was kind of the next step, getting that PhD in order to have those rigorous research methods that would validate a lot of the things that I was experiencing in the sector um, to, or invalidate and give me a different way to look at it. So, so that's why I went on to, to, to get the PhD, the doctorate in philanthropy, uh, nonprofits and philanthropy. It's, it's a doctorate in leadership studies with a focus on um, nonprofits and philanthropy. So, so that's kind of how I, how my journey progressed. Right. So I did not go and get go all the way to get a PhD. As you said, I already had a JD, Juris Doctorate. That's, that's the top for me. But you went ahead and you got the, the PhD, you know, which you had to do a lot of research in the sector and um, a lot of development of the sector. So tell me a little bit about what that was like, getting a PhD in leadership and philanthropy. Uh, well, it was a lot of work. <laughs> There's a reason why they call JD the PhD terminal degrees, because, you know, they, they, they try to kill you as you're doing them because they're just a lot of work. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, the process of, so 
you know, looking back, I, 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 I want to say that not everybody needs to get a PhD to be, a, a, you know, a, a professional in our sector. That was not, not for everybody. Um, and for me, I, I wanted to be able to, um, understand some of the things, the research, um, be able to understand frameworks, give me more tools because I was working with, and I still do work with so many different nonprofit organizations and they all have so many different needs, you know, they're all unique. Um, so for me going and getting that deeper understanding of the tools, the ability to, um, you know, to understand what their needs were to apply different theories and frameworks, I think was one of my, um, uh, uh, I don't know, exciting things about it too, because it just expanded my toolkit. And, and then it also gave me, um, a, a peek into some of the research, you know, oftentimes nonprofit professionals, they, they will tell you, well, we're supposed to do X, Y, and Z. And, uh, they don't always know why. And some of it comes out of this research that comes out of academia about what works oh, in theory, what works in a, in a nonprofit organization. Um, so, so for me, it just allowed me to build that bridge. I call myself a pracademic between the practitioner and the academic, you know, being able to build that bridge of what that research actually means and translate it in a way that makes it understandable to our, you know, a small nonprofit, middle size, medium sized nonprofit, um, and use those tools in a way that makes sense without having to, um, you know, recreate the wheel too. Absolutely. And some of those resources that are coming out of academia and the University of San Diego is just one of many, um, can be applied by nonprofits of all sizes, I think, you know, and it can be anything from program related. So the things that are working, what you um, need to do from a research or from a programmatic standpoint, but it can also be like, what are funders looking for more and more? Um, what are, what is going to resonate with stakeholders, community members, everything? Those are the kinds of things that, you know, students in academia, whether they're in the master's program, um, collaborating with others in their cohort or PhD students, you know, doing research, a lot of really great stuff are, is really coming out of these programs. It's for sure. And I don't know if you've ever um, highlighted the work of ARNOVA, which is the, the International Association for Research on Nonprofit and Voluntary Sector, Voluntary Organization. So much research comes out of that organization uh, from all around the world that I, I learned about in my doc program uh, and that I also share with my master's students, a wonderful resource. Right. And so when... It probably isn't in most nonprofit executive directors' practice to go and dig through the research, but that's where consultants like you and many other people that I have spoken with on the Nonprofit Council podcast really come in to distill all of that good stuff, all those amazing nuggets. Um, so when you're working with your clients, um, how, how does that look? How do they come to you? What are they typically looking for? And also, have you seen a change You know, in the last two, four, six, 10 years? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, it, no surprise. A, a lot of nonprofits I talk to, the first thing they tell me is we need money and we need, we need board members. That's like the top, top two things. And I keep saying, okay, every, yeah, money's a good thing. Everybody needs money. Um, but, and I think other of your guests have always have mentioned, let's say you had the money. What do you know what you're going to do with it? And that's where some of the research comes in to help organizations to figure out what would we do with this money? Um, th things like a logic model, a theory of change, you know, strategic planning, uh, strategy screens, those kinds of things. So, so um, I don't know that the needs have, have changed much, but I think what's changed is that people, nonprofit organizations understand that they, um, they don't know what they don't know more. And they're willing to, to say, you know what, we don't know what we don't know. We need somebody like you as a consultant who, who brings that expertise to help us work through this uh, together. So I, I think what's changed maybe is there's more of a willingness, especially after COVID. You know, a lot of organizations, they realized, oh, wow, there's a lot of things we didn't think about. Um, so it was a wake-up call, I think, for a lot of organizations to really think about um, what we're doing and making sure that we're doing it well. So the shift has been a little bit, in my experience, um, there's more of a, uh, an acceptance and awareness of we don't know what we don't know. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, and I, what I've seen post COVID especially is an increased, you know, um, attention or interest, I guess, in cooperating, collaborating, doing things, you know, aligned um, rather than I think, you know, when I was an executive director and when I was in development, it was competition. 
we're all in competition. Why would I work with that organization? It's doing the same thing I'm doing. So if I work with that person, it's good. They're going to get the money. I'm not. And I think that that's been a real kind of cosmic shift in the sector. It's like, you know, there is, there's a lot of money out there. There's a lot of philanthropic dollars. Look at Fidelity Charitable, for goodness sake. I mean, there's a lot of money. Um, but what is going to really make uh, your organization appealing is not that kind of closed mindset, not that, um, I don't know, competition. You're, you're not a capitalist <laughs> entity. I mean, you can have a little bit of entrepreneurial capitalist tendencies, but, you know, it's not the the dog eat dog, I'm, I'm going to bury you kind of mentality that's going to win, with, especially with funders. They want to see that you're open, that you're willing, that you're giving. And then also, what are the, so what? We give you the money. So what? What's going to happen now? So, and I think that was always really difficult um, for, it has been difficult for the clients that I work with in to distill so what out of their brain. And so I know that you work with, with clients to help them get that out. So what are some of those key tips that you would give to organizations that they're so passionate about what they do and they're doing such good work and they have plans to do such good work, but how do they kind of translate that into a so what to funders? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, that's always a tricky conversation too to have with, with um, organizations, especially if you're working with a board of directors that have been there a long time. There hasn't been a lot of turnover. They get really attached to, to things. Um, and uh, they sometimes have a hard time explaining so what. To, and I always go back to the mission. The mission is foundational for me. What is your mission for, an or for you as an organization? I always start there. And, you know, if, if a board or even if the staff, um, they can't connect what they're doing back to their mission, uh, that tells me that we have a lot of work to do with the so what piece. Um, and so, so I think that the so what is, is, um, for me is understanding, first of all, what the mission is. And if you understand what your mission is and what your purpose, what you're set up to do, you will then be able to articulate the so what. Uh, and I, I like to say, um, you know, if you didn't exist, what would happen? And that's a way to kind of draw out the so what. Why or why is what we're doing important? Um, yeah, that's and, a great tip. Imagine mm -hmm. your community without the services that you provide mm -hmm. rather than. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a great tip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And it's really, again, it, each organization is so different. It's almost like in my work, I have to almost be like a psychologist too to kind of figure out how can I speak in a way that they understand what kind of language is, is important. The so what, you know, we talk about story, storytelling. The so what for some organizations is about telling their story. Other organizations, it's about showing direct impact. Other organizations, it's about a longer term goal. You know, so the so what varies for a lot of different organizations. So I just, I'm always asking questions. Okay, so what about this? Or what about this? Or I'm reflecting. So what I hear you're saying is this, so that they can really kind of drill down, is this what we need? And is this what we want? Um, because if it is, then then that will matter. Right. So I want to circle back to one thing that you mentioned earlier, and that is working with established boards, um, which brings its own set of challenges. And you, you mentioned one. Um, but it, you also mentioned, and I couldn't agree more, that the second thing uh, that organizations typically say they need and they want our board members, um, you know, it's those those resources, the the think tank that the nonprofit needs. So, are there any tips or tricks that you um, advise your clients or your students? Because I mean, <laughs> we both teach in the nonprofit management program at USD. Um, that you kind of give to them when you're when they're looking to basically bring on new board members. Mm -hmm. I'm actually teaching a board development class right now. I'm not currently in the midst of that. Um, and, you know, I love, I love um, helping people think about the board differently. Um, and yeah, I, I just going back to each organization so different. So what do I do? Uh, it's so different for each one. I, I try to, I try to help them understand, first of all, um, their mission, always from both like mission. And who is that mission trying to serve? Okay. And so if, if we understand what the mission is and who it's trying to serve and what it's trying to do, that sheds some light on the kind of pe kinds of people we need at that leadership board level. 
okay, so once we get a sense, everybody goes to the basic matrix. Oh, you know, if they have a uh, legal background, you know, if they're connected to it. Uh, but it's so much more than that. It's, it's so even, much more than that. Yeah. And, and we all talk about diversity and representation. Well, we want to make sure that we're representing our community. We want they have people who bring those either life skills, lived experiences, um, you know, certain types of ethnicity, certain types of skin color. Those are very important, too. And even were they a client? Well, maybe were they were a parent of a client? You know, there's all different ways to really establish what that looks like. But you have to understand, again, your mission and who you're trying to serve to understand what that universe looks like and the people that you need to represent. So it's almost like backtracking. So I, I will always tell boards, you know, this is this is common knowledge. You usually try to bring on people that look like you because that's who you're most comfortable with. And if your board looks a certain way, you're just going to continue to perpetuate that. So you so you have to kind of, again, this is where some of the psychology comes in. You have to kind of break out of some of those mindsets. Um, and, and I, you know, I try to um, just encourage them to think about who are the groups that, that you've heard about in your community, but you've never really interacted with. That's where you start. You start with those folks that you have heard about, but you've never actually met. Um, and to just really get a little bit, just kind of push them a little bit outside their comfort zone. And I find that once they do that, they realize, oh, we can do this. They were, I, I really enjoyed meeting those people. Why didn't I talk to them sooner? Um, and a whole new world opens up for them. But it's about, it's about being intentional and being able to articulate the so what and why, why we need you and why you need us. Because oftentimes, I think boards go out into the community. We need you. We need you. But what is, what's in it for them? Let's talk about what are they going to get out of it? Because it really is about relationship. Everybody says about time, but you have to actually have a reason why they want to join you and what they're going to get out of it, which means you have to understand who they are. You absolutely do. I couldn't agree more. The other thing that I think is a critical piece is evaluating the organization where it is right now, because there are working boards and there are governing boards and there are other types of boards, generative boards, like there are so many different types. And so when you say being intentional, it's in being intentional in the individual that you're asking to be on the board, but also in that whole back and forth quid pro quo, a little for something. Um, what are you asking them to provide? Are they the ones who are going to be packing the boxes you know, when you are doing a food drive? Are, is that what you need from your board right now because you haven't built up enough to have a, a large volunteer base? Or is it you need to show up once a quarter for a really big governing, you know, kind of meeting? And those are so different. And again, interplay with what's in it for them. You know, I might be much more interested in being the working board packing boxes because that's what I really want to do at this stage in my life. Or I could be I'm raising kids. I can't get there, but I can govern really, really well. So, you know, being intentional, I couldn't agree more. Right here. Yeah. And also I would add that, you know, it goes back to recruitment, understanding what you need and why, and starting from there in a way that uh, both people are on the same page, you as the organization and the prospective board member, everybody's on the same page about what's expected. Uh, because the other thing that I hear all the time in the sector is our board is not engaged. And I, I have to say, well, you know, did you set out expectations for them when they first came on or were they more of a, like a warm body kind of thing? This we need to fill a spot, which goes back to being intentional. And it's an ongoing. It's not just something you do once a year. Let's pull out our board matrix and say, OK, who do we need? Who do we have? Let's you know, check out. The it's an ongoing process to always be identifying who it is that you want to interact with. Who is not, who are people that you're not interacting with? How do you know? So it's a continual reflective process. And I tell boards, you have to put this on your agenda because if you don't put it on your agenda, it's not going to happen. And you can't rely on a committee to do all that work. It's got to be at that leadership level because everything trickles down. What happens at that leadership level impacts all the way down to the clients, the cultures, the values, the ideas, it, it all trickles down. So um, it has to be an ongoing process. That's building relationship and um, understanding why and how. Right. Well, and I also think just piggybacking off of that, it, the critical nature of a, a dynamic, well-functioning board in their relationship with a dynam dynamic, well-functioning executive. Um, and I've seen that relationship break down a lot. Um, and it's funny, I think 
at least in my experience, the the impulses of boards is, oh, there's something wrong with that executive. There's something, and they do very little self reflection. Um, but when you take the time to be as intentional as you're describing, and I totally agree with, um, y- you can be a little bit more proactive in that keeping that good relationship with your executive director, your CEO. Um, so it, I've seen boards that are too disconnected. I've seen boards that are too micromanaging. I've seen boards that are, you know, completely hands off, but will blame everything on the executive. So are there any kind of, I don't know, secrets or tips that you would want to um, share that basically about building a really good relationship between a high functioning board and a dynamic executive director? Um, I'm still trying to find the secret, the secret to that, like, so and make my millions. But in absolutely, my, in, my, in my experience, um, it kind of goes back again to that re- recruitment. I do executive searches, and um, one of the things you know, I tell boards right off the bat, you cannot expect to find one person who will make your organization, you know, succeed the way you want it to. It's got to be a collective effort. Effort. It's got to be a collaborative effort, and. So, executive directors, they have a lot of pressure put on them and they have to have a, a myriad of skills. They have to be fundraisers, they have to be administrators, they have to be people people. They have to know how to uh, manage and work with budgets and do you know, all these kinds of things. And we're looking for unicorns. And really what I've been kind of thinking is um, I really feel like in order for an, uh, a nonprofit to really to be managed and run well, you need to segregate some of those duties. But again, it goes back to what is your mission and what do you need to fulfill your mission? So, you know, if you're an organization that it relies heavily on, on cont- donati- donations and contributions, then you're going to want somebody who can be out in the community if you don't have a development department. You're going to want that that face of the organization who's more of the people person, more, on, you know, to bring in those gifts and, and dollars. And then maybe you want somebody who's maybe a deputy director who's handling the internal staff. Or maybe if you're an organization that's more, bureau- more bureaucratic and you have government contracts, then your executive director is going to have to be well versed in how to manage and, and gain contracts and understand legal and policy issues that are related to some of those bureaucratic relationships. Uh, and then you have somebody on the inside who's maybe doing more of the outward facing. So it, it's trying to find the people who who bring the best skill set to meet the need. But it's up to the board to understand what that need is. And so that's where the relationship breaks down. The board wants this savior to come in and help them with all their problems and have all of these uh, experience and not pay them a lot to for some of these smaller organizations. And they're, they're, they're sloughing off their responsibility. And that that's where it breaks down immediately. And so on the flip side, as an executive director, uh, when I'm, when I'm potentially, you know, matching organizations up, it's about being transparent. The organization has to be transparent to that new ED or ED and say, these are our real issues. These are the things that we need help with and not just, you know, create this pie in the sky, rosy, you know, rose colored glasses. You're going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. They really have to be realistic, you know, to show, show those, um, you know, areas that aren't. Warts that and all. Warts exactly. and all. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But that comes back to a board being aware. They have to be asking themselves and doing that work to be aware and to change their mindset about where they are and what they, what they you know, what they don't know. Absolutely. Well, well as we come back to the beginning, the beginning of the establishing of the relationships. Oh, absolutely. Well, the, the relationships are key among the board, the relationship, um, the board, the executive director. And I think a lot of times when I've seen the best, and this isn't like the million dollar magic sauce <laughs> you referenced, but when you have a really good board chair that has a really good relationship with the executive director, because it's tough, if, especially if you have a larger board to, to, kind of manage that relationship. It's like, uh, especially we've both been in the executive director seat. It's like, who do I report to again? Like there's this committee and this committee and this committee. But when you have a really strong board chair or president and you've got a a, a really awesome dynamic executive director, I think that's really where I've seen the magic happen. Yeah. And with that, I will say, I find that vice, vice chairs and vice presidents are the most underutilized board position. You know, again, the same thing with the executive director. We're expecting them to do all these things and we're expecting the president to have just as many skills and talents. But yet leveraging that EVP role for more maybe some of the logistic pieces, more of the maybe leading strategic planning or chairing some of the other committees uh, really allows that chair to, to 
flourish and to to be that support to that executive director. So I think on both ends, both in the internal leadership and the board leadership, there are opportunities to, to start really putting people where they thrive and, and in their skill, skill set. Oh, that's wonderful advice. I was going to ask you if there's anything that you wanted to share with our, our listeners as we close out with that that was phenomenal, right? Right there. Utilize additional people in those vice chair. But if you wanted to add anything, is there anything you'd like to share with our listeners? Oh, boy. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know how much time we have. But I think uh, for, for you, for anybody, you know, whether you want to be a board member or, or you're working with your board or as a board member, you know, working with an executive director, I think for me, it's you gotta you gotta take yourself out of the equation. You gotta take your your personal um, agendas out for the purpose of the organization. That's where most of the breakdowns happen when people put their personal agendas, or they hold on to things too tightly and they forget why am we here in the first place? It's for that mission. It all goes back to the mission. Focus on the mission, and things will work out. Oh wonderfully wise words. Well, thank you so much, Crystal, for joining us on the Nonprofit Council podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Nonprofit Council podcast. For more information and to continue the conversation, head over to nonprofitcouncil.com and sign up for our newsletter. Until next time.